my process of going through how I teach AP Physics 1, I have it broken up into 10 units. Um, I've been doing the videos and I think I'm up to unit 4, um, maybe, maybe started unit 5, honestly I don't remember. But I thought I would skip ahead to unit 9 and talk about waves and sound, um, primarily because it's what I'm currently um, going over. So I'm going to break this video, even though it's one unit, I'm going to break it up into several parts possibly, and this is just the intro. And then I'm going to break it up into looking at um, standing waves, and depending upon the length of that, I might break up my standing wave information. So basically, what we're looking at with this unit is we're going to focus on mechanical waves. Now mechanical waves simply require a medium. Um, <clears throat> to, to travel through. Electromagnetic waves, which can travel through the vacuum of space, don't require a medium. That is not part of the AP Physics 1 curriculum. Only mechanical waves. Now, a couple of terms, you know, we have, you talk about a wave, and, and, and usually you get something that looks like this, um, an ocean wave. And that's perfectly fine, and we're going to be talking about those. But also keep in mind that the same rules apply if we have a single hump, if we have a pulse. No matter what the shape of the pulse is, these same rules that we're going to take a look at apply. So while I might talk about waves, I could be also talking about pulses. If I'm talking about pulses, the same thing applies to waves. So let's look at a couple of the characteristics associated with waves, and this is part of my intro. A lot of times we're going to get a graph um, that shows our vertical height as versus our horizontal displacement. I call this like a snapshot, because this is what a wave looks like at, at some point in time, and let's say t is equal to zero. Um, I, I honestly don't know if that's what it truly is called. I don't really care, um, <coughs> but I call it a snapshot. And what we can tell from this graph is that the wavelength is the length of one full cycle. It doesn't matter where I pick my two points as long as I look at the full cycle. We know the amplitude of the wave, um, our distance from our um, equilibrium point. <coughs> so let's take a look at this point right here. And, and what I'm interested in is graphing a history graph, and that's what this is down here. This is, the, this is going to be the position as a function of time of that point as the wave passes through it. Now one of the things you have to, we have to know is what direction is the wave going? Is it going to the left or is it going to the right? Because that determines the, what this graph looks like. If the wave is moving that way, then this particle is, then this whole wave is shifting to the to my left. This particle is going to start dropping down, and 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 so our position versus time curve is it going to start going downward. Now, if the wave is moving to the right, then as the wave moves to this in this direction this particle is going to then go up and so my velocity or my position versus time is going to go upward. So when we do this history graph it's important to know what direction is our wave going. So, so let's just say the wave is going to the right. <coughs> I'm at equilibrium which is right here and then I'm going to start to go upward because as this wave shifts this way the particle, you see the particle is just going to move up and down, and so my wave graph is going to look something, my history graph is going to look something like that. This is my amplitude. One full wave cycle, though, since I'm looking at time, is the period of the wave. And then from these two pieces of information, we can get the velocity because the period is just one over the frequency. Um, an interesting question that often comes up with this is, what is the average velocity of this particle? In other words, what is the app? 
And what you got to keep in mind is that our average velocity is simply distance divided by time. So, in, it, in the time of one period, the particle moves up, it moves down, back to equilibrium, it then moves down, and then moves back up. So, in the, in the time period of one period of the wave, it's going to go a total distance of four times the amplitude. And you can break that up into you know, the time it takes to go up is one fourth of a period, um, and that's amplitude. But this is particle speed, and what you got to be careful about is confusing it with wave speed. Wave speed is based on the wavelength times the frequency, which is 1 over t. So, um, <coughs> times frequency, frequency, so that's equal to lambda over t. <coughs> well, let me take a second and talk about transverse and longitudinal waves and what the difference is. The difference is actually quite simple. With a transverse wave, a particle is vibrating up and down, and then something happens to cause the energy just, just start getting passed on to the particle adjacent to it and, and we have a wave. And so the velocity of our wave, our wave motion might be horizontally, but the particle is oscillating up and down. And so when the particle is moving perpendicular to the wave direction, that's a this is a transverse wave. Okay. So a longitudinal wave still requires an initial oscillation, but this time it's going back and forth, and then we get this wave to start moving, transferring the energy. And you can see here, it's not as clear, but in these areas right over here, I have overlap. And in these overlap areas result in areas of um, high pressure, or sometimes called compressions. Between the overlaps are areas of low pressure, or rarefactions. You don't use that word often, um, but it's a good word to throw out at parties and people get really impressed. So this is high pressure. This is low pressure. The one thing I forgot to mention with the longitudinal wave is that is that the particle, the wave motion might be to the side, but the particles are also oscillating parallel. So with the transverse wave, particle oscillation is perpendicular to wave motion. Perpendicular, I can't spell. And with the longitudinal wave, it's parallel. I want to talk, you know, and these are our sound waves. Sound waves are longitudinal waves. Explosions are longitudinal waves. I want to talk a little bit more about longitudinal waves and sound waves because a lot of our physics one problems um, revolve around these types of waves. So, I just talked a little bit about transverse longitudinal waves. Let's talk a little bit more about sound waves since these this is a form of longitudinal wave. And let me sketch a sound wave slightly different. So let, so let me just do this real quick. So remember, uh, with a sound wave, the particles are vibrating parallel to the wave motion. And so if the wave is moving this direction, the particles are vibrating basically back and forth. <coughs> These are the areas of the compressions that I had mentioned before. These are the areas of high pressure. These are the areas of low pressure. And so a lot of times what we'll end up doing is we'll graph this type of wave as on a pressure graph. And that is a horrible straight line, but work with me on it. <coughs> and so when we plot it on a pressure graph, the low pressure are troughs and the high pressure are crests. So it might look something like it might look something like this, where 
these high pressure re represents the um, compressions or the, or the crest of the waves, and the low pressure represents the troughs. And in here, when we, when we look at this type of a graph, we can see, oh, wait a minute, if my horizontal dip, if my horizontal axis is like my, my, my distance, my horizontal distance, then one full wave cycle is a wavelength. One full wave cycle is a wavelength. These are much more user-friendly graphs to work with since we can, it's easier to see the information um, the, we can see the amplitudes and such on the pressure and not that that's overly critical. <coughs> so let's take a quick look as part of our introduction as to all the equations on the formula sheet that relate to waves. The only one is lambda is velocity over frequency. That's it. <coughs> the velocity of the wave, and this is the most important, one of the most critical things to understand. It's based on the medium. If the medium changes in any way, the wave speed will change. And I'm not just talking about we're going from one medium, air, into a brick wall. That's obviously a medium change. But different air temperatures also represents a medium change. So you've got to be very careful about that. The frequency is often denoted or given by the oscillator. So the oscillator frequency will determine the wave frequency. The, the medium determines the wave velocity. Our end result is the wavelength that, that, that can change. Now, here's where you've got to be a little bit careful. We can rearrange this equation, and sometimes our situation will determine the wavelength, like a guitar string. That's going to determine um, the wavelength of our wave because it's set between the between the frets. The velocity still is determined by the medium, but we can tighten and we can loosen these guitar strings. And if you've ever plucked a guitar string and tightened it, you heard the sound change because our medium is changing, our velocity is changing, our wavelength stays the same, our frequency is going to change. So there's a couple of rules you need to, or I shouldn't say rules, a couple of trends to, to be aware of. One of them deals with air temperature. As air temperature goes up, the speed of sound, that, that wave speed, the velocity of the wave is going to increase. You don't have to know the exact relationship, you just need to know that if temperature goes up, wave speed goes up, and if temperature goes down, wave speed goes down as well. The other relationship is with the string, and it, and, and, it, and it deals with tension. And so as the tension of the string goes up, the wave speed goes up. As tension goes down, wave speed goes down. Again, there is a nice fancy equation that relates tension to velocity, and quite honestly, I have no idea what it is. I don't really care, because we're not going to get, if you need to know the equation like for a problem, they might give it to you. Otherwise, they're looking for a qualitative treatment, or I'm sorry, a quantitative treatment between tension, velocity, frequency, whatever, air temperature, velocity, wavelength, whatever the question relates to. Alright, the next topic area that I cover as part of the introduction to waves is what's called superposition. This is what happens when two waves or two pulses are in the same place at the same time. The resulting wave or pulse adds up. And so waves, pulses add up. They always add up. Remember, when I say add, I don't necessarily mean bigger. 5 plus 5 is 10. That's great, but 5 plus minus 5 is 0. So this adding up can also be um, getting smaller. <coughs> this superpositioning process only happens as they pass through each other. And, and this is not an unusual question. Um, it was been a pre-response problem 
um, and, and sometimes kids do well and sometimes they don't. So, for example, let's say we have two pulses. And we call it A and we call it B. B is moving that way. They're moving towards each other. When they pass through each other, these two waves will add up and we will get a bigger single pulse, basically A plus B. Once this occurs, they're going to continue moving. They don't. It doesn't stop like this. They're they're moving. A's moving. B's moving. And then pretty soon, what we end up with is pulse A continuing in a tappy merry direction, and pulse B continuing in a tappy direction. It's like this never happened to them because they don't really care. This is what we see. Another example, and, and, and so this is where they build up, and that's called constructive interference. I, it's not that critical that they know that term. And then the other term is destructive, which you can probably guess what that is. So let me just kind of go through the process and sketch these out real quick. So we got A, B, but this time when they pass by each other, if A and B, if this is a if this is a case of five, and this is a case of negative five, they're going to add up to right there. They perfectly cancel each other out. B goes on its happy merry way. A goes on its happy merry way. Nothing happens. They need to be able to take several pulses or two pulses and at least be able to predict where they're going to be at some future point and then how do multiple pulses um, superposition with each other and they and they need to be able to sketch that and identify that this is called constructive interference this is called destructive interference it's not overly critical they know those terms but they need to know the ideas So the last thing, and this is, I, I cover all this introductory stuff in about three days maybe. Um, the last thing as part of the introduction, what I want the kids to recognize and, and to know is this idea of reflection. This is a funny part in Physics 1 because they don't necessarily say they have to know what reflection is. But it is incredibly helpful for them to understand what goes on with the motion of pulses and waves. I don't get we don't get into refraction and we don't get into diffraction. But I define reflection is the wave is going down through a medium and it encounters a new medium. Which means it doesn't necessarily mean a new medium, but it encounters a different medium. Maybe the, maybe the air temperature has changed a little bit. Maybe the water temperature has changed a little bit. We encounter a boundary. And so a reflection occurs when the wave bounces off a new, off a, and I'm going to write new medium. The medium property changes. And so that means it's new. So there's two types of reflections, and it's not that they necessarily need to know these, but I think it's very helpful. Um, one of them is called um, a fixed or closed reflection. And what this means is that the medium is fixed. Um, a guitar string, perfect example. That string is tied to the wall. It's a fixed medium. And the other type is what's called um, loose or open. And so the medium can move. Um, a water wave in a pool. Medium can move. I started right way. So stupid. <coughs> so let's look at the fixed one first. And let's say we have a rope and it's tied to the wall and we send a pulse down that rope. 
So when that pulse hits the end, what happens, because it is fixed, the pulse is going to come back inverted. Let's say it's loose. So let's take the same string, but now it's tied to a hoop that can move up and down the wall without without any type of um, friction. When this pulse gets to the end of the wall, it is not reflected, and so not inverted. As I mentioned before, it's a little bit, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little bit unclear as to the level of detail that we need to get into it that the College Board expects um, the kids to be able to know. I like going through this with them because when we look at standing waves, when we look at some of the pulse problems, it is important for them to understand what happens at the edge of the medium. If they know when it gets inverted and when it doesn't, I think that makes the problem solving a lot easier. So that wraps up all my intro stuff about waves. Um, the next thing I get into, and I and I still have to make this one up, is talking about the different standing waves, harmonics, um, beats, and Doppler. And and so that will be all put in the next video for um, this unit. I hope you have found some use to this. Good luck.